just before the beginning, I'll share my motivation. Um, we're developing these tools in digitalization because without digital tools, it seems to be impossible to address the systemic problems of sustainability, circularity, responsible consumption. We held a workshop with Decima a few years ago and then um, wrote a position paper together with a few industrial partners and together with UNEP, which kind of highlights why, um, why this is a system level problem, how the circularity principles, which are in the bottom of this picture uh, with the different um, routes for circularity are linked to uh, sustainability, uh, circular supply chain problems, and the necessity of having the cyber domain where you can place appropriate tools. Classical tools of reduction in science actually don't work on the system level problems. The chemistry is a system level problem. And one of the things which really motivates me is um, the potential solutions to drastically redesign the chemistry and significantly reduce the the impact of the molecules. I work with performance molecules and materials mostly. This is pharma formulations, advanced materials. In UK, those are the crown jewels exporting industries. Um, those are made from hub molecules and platform molecules where actually UK has almost no capacity to make them. So most of those are imported. And then these molecules are made from commodities and raw materials. And again, those are predominantly fossil made today. There was a recent paper from the University of Cambridge, another group in engineering, which was looking at the pathways for defossilization of the chemical industry and identifying that that's actually technically possible. And what is interesting from that paper are the numbers that two thirds of the emissions are not from the manufacture of those performance molecules. They are from the feedstocks, basically using oil, and from the uh, use phase and after and end of life. So the, the one of the things which I'm working on now, primarily is how to defossilize the entire uh, value chain of chemicals. Now, in order to do that, and in order to build the digital tools for this, we are building the entire toolbox, which starts maybe, if I start in the middle, uh, with an automated experiments. We're gonna look at some of those, which generate large amounts of data. The data needs to be classified, so we need to understand what is it our machines have observed, how to, place those data in the correct boxes in our uh, data repositories. Those repositories are then linked with all of the existing data. This could be, for example, commercial databases such as Reaxis or CAS or um, your institutional ELNs, uh, quantum chemistry results and everything else, the thermodynamics, reaction mechanisms, environmental impact factors, toxicity, all of this is chemical data which needs to be labeled, which needs to be understood what it is, where is it sitting, how reliable is this data, how old is this data, and how to use it. In order to be able to do that, we have to develop chemical ontologies, which is a description, explicit description of the relationships between various data elements. Only then we could have algorithmic tools which actually deal with chemical knowledge. The knowledge is our hypothesis. What is the reaction mechanism and what, for example, is a kinetic mechanism? How to predict properties of formulations, the hypothesis about those various bioactivity models. These are all now knowledge models and um, there is a lot of work on algorithmic use of chemical knowledge and algorithmic generation of chemical knowledge, which is then allows us to formulate new hypotheses, translate them into experiment formulations and rerun the experiments if we are looking after generation of new data. So I'm going to cover a few things from this 
overall pipeline and I'll focus on chemistry, but mostly on materials and, and formulations, since I think it's more relevant for this audience. Today is a snapshot of various things which already are entirely feasible within the digital toolbox. You can draw a chemical structure on a piece of paper or in a file like a chem draw, and it will be can be converted into a machine readable format, something like smiles. You can predict solubilities, not very well, but you can. Um, you can answer in question, would molecule A react with molecule B, and you will get a decent accuracy answer. You can find commercial, uh, so routes for molecules from commercially available substances. Uh, you can look for replacements. If something is currently made from fossils, can you find a replacement from a wire feedstock? You can do it. You can do it commercially and routinely. Uh, you can ask a question, can I make this molecule B? Can I avoid the patterns? Again, you can do that. Um, you can optimize a reaction for yield and minimal cost entirely robotically without having to, to have a person in the lab. There are some things which are still very difficult. If you want to optimize a multi-step sequence of reaction separations, that is still an unsolved problem. There are a few papers appearing on this, but it isn't solved. Um, Predicting toxicity is not solved. Biodegradability is also very difficult. But for example, discovering molecules with specific functional properties is actually becoming available. Uh, there are uh, more and more publications coming up with really decent accuracy models which, which do that. And there are uh, multiple startup companies who are exploiting this new functionality. The development in this field now moved into thinking about fully digital workflows and fully digital labs. So I'm going to show a couple of examples and then I go into specifics um, uh, what, what we've done. So this diagram is from a paper, recent paper from Connor Collis group in MIT, where they uh, highlight what are the building elements or the elements of this integrated infrastructure. Of course, everything starts from data. You need to have access to a variety of chemical data sets and they have to be labeled and you have to have a way of understanding what, what are all the elements are. You need to have the software codes, different uh, machine learning models and um, heuristics. And this is where there is more and more uh, prevalence of um, language models to allow to orchestrate this um, laboratory assistance or research assistance. And then you have digital twins, which is your connection to the real lab. In the last few months, perhaps, or sort of late last year, beginning of this year, perhaps the most exciting paper which came out on, on this topic is from the group of Philip Schwaller. Um, he did masters in Cambridge then moved to IBM, uh, did PhD in, in Zurich, and then he's now an academic in, in Lausanne, also in uh, EPFL. And um, what his group has shown that it is possible to use language models to orchestrate. So you can ask a very complex question about designing a molecule, finding the reaction pathway to that molecule, and then optimizing that. And the the tool they've built, which is open source, you can download it and play with it, is um, assembling the AI agents which can perform different tasks of this. So you can look at literature synthesis, you can execute it on the robot, and you can perform a literature search and so on and so on. So this is sort of state of the art, and there is more and more work on different tools which allow to access um, digital infrastructure for um, modern chemical R&D. For the rest of the talk, I will show you a few examples of what those tools are. Uh, so the individual bits of that uh, overall system and how you can use it in specific tasks. Perhaps the most developed task in this field 
is the task uh, is the pro problem which we call optimization. You want to optimize a chemical reaction or you want to optimize a, so make an organic molecule, for example, or you want to optimize um, a reaction that makes you inorganic material or organic inorganic hybrid, pretty much anything. You can apply exactly the same for uh, a bioreactor. The, 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 the code and behind it will be actually identical. So this example we've published a few years ago, it's a flow chemistry system is based on the commercial units. So in the middle are the pumps, the, the reactors. These are fed from a liquid handling robot. We use this robot to assemble the uh, reaction mixtures. So you can say, I want to choose that particular solvent from a list. I want to choose this ligand from the list. I want to choose that catalyst solution from that list. It's a liquid handling system. If you have money to spend, you can add a do solid dosing system to that as well. Those are a lot more expensive. Um, so the liquid formulation for your experiment is designed by a software made by that liquid hand and robot, injected into your reaction robot. Then the products of the reaction are fed into the HPLC, or if you prefer into HPLC MS, or if you prefer directly to MS, or we also have an NMR sitting underneath. So you have a choice of analytical instruments to use. The outcomes are converted into concentration. So the reaction outcomes or properties of materials. It's not my next example. And then you feed it back into the algorithm and it runs. So um, let's switch it quickly. Um, Okay, let's see if it does well. Okay, that's supposed to work. That's a video, but it doesn't do this anything. Anyway, so um, this is the video, which for some reason decided not to play. Uh, the, uh, the algorithms we typically use are Bayesian optimization, which means that we start with a certain uh, initial design, so a few experiments, and then uh, point to options automatic. Oh, that plays this way. So we have a space filling design, which basically positions experiments to explore the design space. So your range of concentrations, range of flow rates. Once you've done this initial experiments, the model begins to learn from that. And then it performs experiments. So these blue experiments are then performed by guided by the machine learning code, which we uh, balance between how much of the unknown chemical space we explore or how much we target the optimization. So going for, in this case, minimum cost and maximum yield. So we get in a Pareto set of solutions. All of the solutions are good. You have to then choose which ones you actually want to run. So this technology is becoming pretty much standard. There are multiple installations in different companies and academic labs, and it can be used not just for organic synthesis, but it can be used for inorganic synthesis and for uh, making materials. So this is example when we are using um, a, our process technology we've developed in the group it's a flow technology for manufacture nanomaterials. In this case, we're making zinc oxide, nano zinc oxide, and we needed to optimize the synthesis conditions to make the material and with a maximum antimicrobial properties. If you're in that field, you may know that you, you can buy nano zinc oxide at the moment from commercial manufacturers, but if you test it by activity, most likely it will be close to zero. Um, most of them actually lie about the bioactivity. This synthesis, the traditional batch technology is very much non-scalable and the properties are not controllable. So we've designed uh, a way how, how to make those materials with very tight control of properties, but in order to optimize it, we actually use exactly the same algorithm which is working for us in organic chemistry, which is called this TSEMO. So in this case, 
what it does is then we optimize the yield of the material against the antimicrobial score, which in this case is the we're using the um, petri dish test. So looking at the size of the ring around the bacteria, uh, how much is killed or how little bacteria is grown, and that gives us the uh, the Pareto set of solutions. The guide diagrams on the right are showing you exactly the same behavior. The initial period of experiment is exploration. This is space filling design, so-called Latin hypercube. And then afterwards, the, the code is beginning to work and it finds the optimal flow rates, the optimal ratios of reagents and the concentration of the zinc precursor. It does really allow us to make, to find conditions for the synthesis where you can make large stars, you can make aggregates of tiny stars, or you can get um, the uh, um, sort of different shaped nanoparticles, and some of them work and some of them don't. So if you don't control this, you, you actually get a mixture, and that's what most people do, and uh, then your antibacterial properties are pretty bad. This optimization part of the digital workflow is really well developed. If you are interested, these are all of the freeze resources. So you take a snapshot of the um, of the table if you want. The first two are from uh, Toronto, from the group of Aspera Guzik, two different packages for optimization using machine learning. Then there is NextTorch. This one, Summit, it's our code. We typically advise people to start from that one, mostly because it's it contains multiple algorithms. It contains uh, it's very well documented. It contains exercises and basically guides you how to get started. Um, and it's a benchmarking um, package, so you actually have already encoded benchmarks there, so you can try it on something. So now. We have the individual robots, we have the individual software packages, they sit somewhere in the lab. We then ask, ask ourselves a question, how do we make this a bit more accessible? And so we've teamed up with a, uh, another professor in, in Cambridge, Professor Marcus Kraft and his student Jairo, who's now finished, uh, graduated. Uh, and Jairo has come up with this idea that the way how we should really approach this is through creating digital twins of our equipment, but do it in a particular way, do it through ontologies and placing those digital twins in what is known as a dynamic knowledge graph. Then in this dynamic knowledge graph, we can host prior data, we can host the machines themselves, as well as the software agents, which can work with the data and with the machines. And the dynamic knowledge graph is automatically updated. So status of the machines, status of your data is constantly updated by the uh, agents themselves. So in this case, we're now in the situation when the scientist has access to the cyberspace, I've mentioned it in my, one of my first slides, where they have access to the agents which design the task, where you can design what is it you're going to do with your data and with your machines, and where you can run those automated cycles. For example, design it, find the conditions, process data, iterate to get the next target, so you can have that access to that loop within that cyberspace. And then that is connected to the physical labs. What is interesting here, if you do it through the knowledge graph and this architecture, it becomes pretty much irrelevant where those labs are. So what we then did is we've um, used the fact that we have two pretty much identical setups. Uh, one is sitting in Singapore, it's a picture on the right, the one is sitting in Cambridge. They use similar instruments for performing chemistry, similar liquid handling robots, but slightly different analytics. And so we made them work together on the same task. They both have digital twins in the same dynamic knowledge graph. They are operated by the same agents, which allow to see 
which machine is available when, is experiment done or not, is machine healthy, it can run, and then schedule the experiments and run them on, on different machines. What you have as a result is then uh, here, it's a fairly standard chemistry we use, we, we are using for testing these kind of instruments, and we run in this experiment in two different labs simultaneously. The, the orange symbols are in Singapore, the blue ones in Cambridge, and it's the same one optimization code which uses the experiments from both labs. Now, if you are paying attention to the graph, you will probably spot that there are far fewer Singapore data points than, than the blue circles. And that's the reason that the Singapore lab at some point, um, the instrument broke down and stopped working. But the code knows that there is another machine available and just keeps going with another one. And But it still uses all of the data from both machines. So we're going to be continuing this type of work and further development, developing these tools when you can use experiment the same experiment in different labs as well as different experiments in different labs but this one is based on a relatively expensive instrument we've also looked at creating something very very low cost so our um, uh, one of our spin out companies accelerate materials has built a platform which is called am learn which combines um, the underlying technology for connecting third-party equipment into fully automated systems. So all of the handling of the drivers, uh, connect connectivity of the system is all taken away from the user, so it's all done by the software. And on top of that, there is a graphical user interface and access to the, the best machine learning optimization codes. So it allows to very quickly set up uh, self automation or self uh, driven experiments um, using fairly low cost instruments, the instruments you might already actually have. So you don't need to buy the new ones, which um, lab integrators would, would want to sell you for for very large amount of money. So here there is uh, automation part which connects reactors, sensors and dozing, as well as then the algorithmic part where you design your experiments, you perform the experiments, and you have uh, access to machine learning codes. The advantage of this environment, if you compare to how else you could do this, so these are different uh, providers of different types of automation, is that um, there is a model selection there, it's out of the box automation, you can do integration with third party equipment, it's actually based on the open source engine, which means that we are going to grow the community which enhances the system, particularly with the drivers and so on. And it's a no code environment. So you don't need to be a programmer to start using uh, this type of automation. So how then we can use these things, um, robotics, advanced algorithms in really complex cases and this is probably one of the most complex one we've attempted in the last few years um, it's been a long project it's now it's it's a third project we're doing we did, we did on the same type of problem when we're trying to create a workflow which would allow us to predict the properties of formulations from as little data as possible we we had a bit of i'm going to come back to this slide um we had a bit of a prior art in this we were looking at shampoo formulations uh with our industrial partner bsf when we're trying to mix a combination of surfactants polymers rheology modifiers to get the right properties and the properties are you typically need particular way how it looks so it shouldn't be too turbid Obviously, the formulation needs to be stable. Uh, it needs to have a particular range of um, uh, viscosity, and it needs to be, have a particular pH. And we do this through a similar Bayesian type uh, workflow, but it has a, an intermediary. It has also a classification model. And I'll explain a little bit more in, uh, in the next case study why, why do we need 
the classification model. So when we did this first time a few years ago, we have shown that we actually can find formulations. So here we are comparing results for a mixture of surfactants, thickness, uh, polymers, where we have three criteria. What's the turbidity? What's the viscosity? What's the price? Where we are comparing results of the high throughput campaign done within the company with the same formulation ingredients and the ones we've designed and we can find better solutions. We can find combinations which they didn't find through the high throughput campaign. So the question is why and how can we make it a lot more generic? So for the generic, what we really want to do, we would like to start from the chemistry. What's in our ingredients and predict, is it going to be a stable formulation? How do we then adjust the pH? and what's going to be the viscosity. So that's the, uh, that's the dream. And we kind of made an effort to, to get closer to that. So these results are now published. The, um, uh, the first part is the, uh, a new version of the pH adjustment code, which was published early in the year. And then the second paper is the actual data set which we've generated for um, uh, formulations for liquid liquid formulations to generate the data set Aniket who was running this project had to design a new DOE algorithm had to figure out how to dose liquid um, ingredients or viscous liquid ingredients has to design a new pH algorithm and then do all of the characterization offline to generate the data set to then perform it so I'm going to take you through a few elements of this workflow just to show you what goes in, where there may be some complications, and how this could be how this could be used. So in this specific problem, there are a couple of complex issues. One of them relates to the size of the problem. Our liquid formulation will have a thickener. It will have a polymer. It will have a range of surfactants. It's all mixed in water. And so those ingredients, thickener polymer surfactants, are obviously commercial substances. So they are not a molecule with a well-defined composition. They are a distribution of those. So um, they're actually not that well characterized, and they could have some impurities. Then. When we are formulating, we have a choice. We have a range of thickness available and a range of polymers and a range of surfactants. So our design space for formulations is absolutely astronomical. There's, there's so much choice. And it's really, really difficult to think of a fully automated workflow which would allow you to explore all of that design space. It's just totally impossible. So in this case, because our task was to build, uh, to construct a data set, so effectively run the experiments to explore that, that, that chemical space as much as possible, and then see whether we can develop machine learning models based on that data set. Our design of experiments problem is rather unique. We're not, we're not optimizing anything. We're optimizing the exploration of the chemical space, if it makes sense. So what we had to do is we had to maximize the amount of usable data we are generating whilst exploring the entire chemical space. And if you've ever done liquid formulations, many of the formulations will be unstable. So you mix this thing, you think you 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 store it, and it splits and that is a totally useless formulation for a consumer product so absolutely no point in measuring how turbid it is and how um, viscous it is if you remix it again because it's never going to be a commercial product so you want to be able to maximize how many stable formulations you are creating so we had to figure out how do we build a classifier for that 
and then you want to explore the chemical space within this stable formulation. So it's a quite a complex design of experiments challenge. So what Aniket has done, with he's collaborated with our statistician friend from Southampton, uh, Professor Dave Woods, and um, they've come up some time ago with this weighted space filling design, which directs the search to particular relevant uh, or relevant regions of of experimental space, and that's what we need. That's where our classifier comes in. But in order to explore the space as much as possible, Anika has adopted this Max Pro QQ package, which is a little bit better than the Latin Hypercube for the exploration of, of the space. So all of this is published. The, the Max Pro QQ is published and the weighted space fit in design. Original work from Dave Wood is, 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 is also published. Our uh, combination of this for this specific task is, is already available on the archive. You can download the codes and, and play with it. Now, the because we want to explore the chemical space and try to get some predictability, or try to start linking the chemicals, chemistry of these molecules, not just names of surfactants and names of polymers and so on, um, into our models. We started with um, surfactant molecules because they're a little bit better defined and we can easier work with those compared to polymers and thickeners. So that's kind of next step um, in, in this project. So the surfactant molecules, we can characterize by the functional groups. So we do a bit of chemoinformatics. We identify what are the functional groups, different elements of them. So these are highlighted in green. And then we can enumerate the concentrations of those functional groups, depending on which surfactant you actually use, because different surfactants will have different functional groups. You were in the formulation, you have more than one surfactant. And so that is then gives you a potential description of the impact of a particular functionality when you are combining two uh, surfactants together. And then we had to figure out how to use these combinations. So use a polymer, use a thickener, and then a combination of two surfactants. So that gives you a five-dimensional design of experiment space. So um, there is a, so I have a kind of a bit more technical description how this Max Pro QQ design works. We have 10 minutes left, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this one. It's better if you if you want, please have a look at the paper. Uh, this is for the experts in, in the audience. Um, this allows to try to explore the chemical space as much as possible, whilst also using the, um, the classifier so that it focuses on the, uh, on the stable space. What I can show you is the have we have we actually managed to explore the chemical space? And I think we can. So on this diagram, we have a different surfactants on the x-axis and the frequency of appearance in the data set, which we've generated. Here we compare just space filling design, which is the blue bars, and the stability guided design. And you see there's some differences. So the stability guided design favors specific surfactants because that's where the exploration of the chemical space is, is wider. And then in terms of the polymers, uh, thickness and surfactants together, uh, for all of the different ingredients which were studied, there is quite a broad distribution of the concentration space. So the coverage of the experimental space, which is uh, done, um, achieved in, in this design, which is now represented in the, in the data set we've published, is, is quite broad. And then just to highlight the classifier, this is probably the most successful model from this work. The phase stability classifier works very well. This is sort of area under the curve type diagram. If you're closer to 50-50 line, then it doesn't work. Uh, the closer it is to this line, at the top, the better is the classifier, 
and and this phase stability classifier works really quite well. We can use some of the interpretability methods, and this is for the first time we're beginning to see the benefit of chemically describing what is what are our surfactants. So these are different functional groups. Then there is a thickener. Then there is a polymer. And the bars are showing the importance of these features. Now two different methods: the from the tree model from random forest feature importance, or from so-called sharp method, which also highlights the importance of the feature. We see, for example, thickener is particularly important in both methods, and we notice that the thickener is really important for achieving the stability. So more thickener actually makes less stable formulations, and we also see significance of some of the functional groups. So that allows us to start having some form of interpretability of the chemistry impact on, on, on our formulations. So somewhere in the middle of that pipeline, so I've described the design of experiments. So let me show you this picture again. So this was the design of experiments and the stability classifier which goes into this, which allows us then to formulate the experiments to run in the liquid handling robot, do the image analysis, confirm the stability. After that, we have this step of pH adjustment. And this is my last topic for, for today is, is how do you do that? The pH adjustment is turns out to be uh, quite a uh, difficult task. So I'm trying to go again here. And so Aniket had to, with the team in Singapore, had to build one. Uh, so it's built on the basis of a 3D printer platform. So the X, Y, Z movement is there uh, in the frame. They built all 3D printed all of the components. They solved the problems around uh, handling of liquids, fluids, uh, cleaning the probes and so on. So there's quite a few components which go into the um, development of this instrument. Uh, we all like open sourced um, information. We use uh, codes from other people, robots from other people as much as possible. So Anik and the team have prepared an IKEA style guide, which is also published. It basically step-by-step -step guide, how do you make one of those? So if you really want to make your own pH bot, which automatically titrates your solutions, um, there is a guide. Uh, there is now Mark II as well available, which um, the team uh, will be very happy to talk about. So why this is difficult and what has to go into creating a, um, a machine learning model to do the pH adjustment, not just the robot. If you have your target pH around six, you have an, an, a solution with unknown composition. Some of the ingredients are polyionic species with distribution of properties. And because you are creating mixtures which then go in contact with human skin, you cannot use aggressive uh, acids or, 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 or bases for adjustment. So you use citric acid. If you look at your composition of your shampoo bottle, you will see citric acid. It's the titration agent for making the shampoo actually okay for the skin. Now, if you use just a linear uh, approximation for where do you need to go into in, in this pH to adjust how much of H or OH you have to add, you're dealing with polyprotic acids, which create buffer solutions, which means that if you overshoot your uh, target pH and you go into the buffering regime, it will take you forever to get out of there to reach the pH. So classical machine learning data-driven methods will totally fail. They will go into that buffering regime and they will not know what to do with it. So within that, uh, even for the initial experiments, 
and it can come up with a weighting function. So depending where you are on the pH scale, what, where your first experiments are, there is a weighting function, which then um, adjusts how much of the acid or the base you're adding, depending on where you are. So that really helps in how the robot dosing the, the chemistry. But then in order to make it really predictive and very, very robust, and again, the, the constraints in the pH adjustment and formulations is extremely tight. You want to be able to hit your target pH within two or three doses because you're limited by the volume. You can't just keep doing it. So you need to hit the right pH within very few number of data points. So the way we solve this problem is we actually gave the machine learning model prior information about the physical chemistry. We know what the speciation of the polyprotic acids is. So we can give the model all this information about the physical chemistry. So depending on the pH, you have different amounts of different types of ions. We pre-train the, the, uh, the base model behind it on this kind of information. And so then the, the kernel underneath the model is already a smooth function without any uh, sharp minima or maxima because we know that this is a smooth function for polyprotic type systems. And so we can actually um, effectively uh, titrate. So in this case, two initial points, and then you go very, very close to the, to the target points. And this slide is just an illustration what happens if you overshoot. So you go, you for example, you add a lot, you go into this buffering regime and you try and to go back to your target pH. You add in and add in and add in and add in, nothing changes uh, because you are in the buffer and your pH basically doesn't change. If you're doing a classical Bayesian method, it will keep adding the same amounts pretty much and it will, it will fail because there are way too many stops and you overrun your volume. So this is where first we know where not to go on this curve because we added the physics. And second, we use that adjustment for the volume. So the weighting function, uh, which allows us to adjust how much volume to add if you had overshoot in, in the pH scale. So this is very close to the end. Um, it works very well. We can titrate most of the systems we've tried within three, four um, experiments. Uh, when we have overshoots and we don't have overshoots, obviously when we have overshoots, it takes a bit longer because you you have to come back. Um, and we also learn how to scale it. Our industrial partner said we actually do formulations on the larger scale because we need those samples for multiple tests. So what if we need to scale it to, let's say, half a liter? The, the thing we had to account for is the stabilization of the measurement, which is a function of viscosity, uh, which allows us to then account for the volume. So that actually is a log-log linear function, which we then included in the model. And so now our algorithm knows how long to wait for the measurement uh, depending on how viscous is, is the solution. So with this, I would like to end. Um, the conclusions are basically, this is a development field. We are gradually developing this overall machinery for a digital toolbox. All of these boxes have to be filled. In order to have a fully automated lab, you really need to have pretty much all of that in place. It's a very collaborative field because nobody knows everything about that. Uh, we like everybody who works in this field um, and we collaborate with pretty much everyone in, in this field. It's a very open source field. Everything is published. All the codes are published and um, it's a very exciting area uh, to work in. And then I'll, I'd like to acknowledge all the researchers who worked on this, our partner company, Accelerated Materials, and our industrial partners and the public funding for, uh, for this work. And I thank you for your attention.